stop and look sad. And, and I, want, I have to wonder what was going on in the head. I wonder if they were saying, how can we explain in a few words this weekend? How, how can we ever tell this man what happened? Remember, the gift of the Holy Spirit hasn't come. Nobody's, they're not even convinced really who Jesus is. There's a lot of stuff that happened. So how do you explain to someone when you don't know yourself that the Savior of the world died on a cross and is risen from the dead? When you don't even know yourself. And they stop and I think, I think about the grief and I think the grief just kind of overtook them. You know, they're in the deep discussion, deep discussion, deep discussion for seven miles. They're talking. And then someone says, what are you talking about? And they stop and go, oh my God. What pain. What sorrow. What grief. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? Now, that's hint number one, that they're not part of the eleven. Now, some say Cleopas was actually the uncle of Jesus. He was Joseph's brother and the father of Simeon. And Simeon would later become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So, so again, why wasn't he in the morning? He's a direct relative to Jesus. Things are not happening the way they're supposed to. Now, they can't seem to grasp that this man doesn't know what happened. Reality is, there's lots of people in Jerusalem who probably didn't know what happened that weekend. When something is the main event in our lives, we tend to think it should be that way for everybody else, right? If something's affecting us, why aren't you stressed out? I went through that Friday night. It was the pancake supper this weekend for the firemen, and so Friday night I went to help set up, and I'm standing there talking to the firemen. We haven't really started setting stuff up, and and there's a call comes over my radio that there's a car accident in Howick. Okay. So we're standing there talking, and the guy comes over, and he says, well, I'm on scene. It's right in front of Dan Brown. Well, that's my son-in-law. So I pick up my phone, and I call Mallory, and she doesn't answer. So then I call Dan. And he doesn't answer. Then I call Mallory again. And the firemen are still talking. And she doesn't answer. And I call Dan again. And he doesn't answer. Finally, the chief says, well, you're no use to us. You better go. <laughs> and so I race down there, literally. And when I get to their farm, which is not... The, they're building a new house on the farm, but they're living... At, they, they own another house on the English River, and that's where the accident was. But the farm's between here and there. So I get to the farm, and I pull in to see if they're there. And there's Dan... Standing up in the front lawn, and he sees me coming down the driveway like an idiot. He says, what's wrong? It was a main event in my life. I prayed the whole way there. I had visions of my daughter backing out of that driveway with two little kids in the car. It was a main event in my life. Dan says, what's wrong? It's like, are you alive? We, we think when something is a main event in our lives, it should be a main event in everybody. Everybody should know about it, right? <laughs> the truth of the matter is, Jesus never said he didn't know what was happening or what had happened. He just asked them what they were talking about. And I'm grouped Verses 19 and 24 together because I think this is the way it was said. And that's just the Bible according to Randy, okay? It doesn't say this anywhere, but this is just the way I, I think it was said. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the redeemer of Israel. Yes, besides all this, now is the third day since it happened. Moreover, some women in company amazed us. When they went to the tomb early in the morning, they did not find his body. They came back saying that he even seen a vision of angels who, had, who said he was alive, and some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found him just as the women said, but they did not see him. 
Like I think he's wrong. What do you mean you don't know? What do you mean? Like wow, what a story. He found the words, right? Can you understand now why we're in such intense conversation? Listen to everything that has happened. Don't you see why we're grieving? Why we are distraught? Why we are confused? You see, we don't understand why all these things happen. And we don't know what's next. You know, he says, we thought he would be the one to deliver Israel. And the delivery had happened. We just haven't received the package yet. They, they, just, they just don't recognize it. And so, we thought this was going to happen and it didn't happen. I'm convinced that it's probably about Oh, there's probably thousands of people every Saturday morning get up and realize they didn't actually win the 649. <sighs> They're going to go to work tomorrow. This is a little bit more important than the 649. But I just, I just, I'm trying to sympathize with them in the fact that what's next? How, how do we pick up this mess? Where do we go from here? And he said to them, Old oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all things the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay? So Jesus is quick to take over the conversation, take over the lead in this discussion. And now, remind them about the prophecies about himself. Now, he does all of them. That's what it says, all of them. I'm just going to do a few. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up from you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then he repeats it again a few verses later. It says, God, He says, God said, I will raise up a up from them a prophet like you from among the brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. Moses' prophecy about Jesus. About suffering, Isaiah 53. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his words we are healed. Again, Isaiah 53, it says, He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Remember I said that? He didn't say anything. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that was before the shears, is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Psalm 41 says, Even my close friends in whom I trust who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. He had to be betrayed by his close friends. Zechariah says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. That's why you guys are walking down the road. Because the sheep was struck. The shepherd was struck and the sheep was scattered. Because it's prophecy. Because I said it was going to happen. <clears throat> and while they're talking about this, he steps into the pic picture and begins to teach them that it had to happen just that way. The Pharisees, the, Pharisees, the Pharisees thought they were setting Jesus up. And the reality was, he was setting them up. And the plan worked. 
<laughs> so they drew near to a village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Do you see how interesting they, interested they are in what he is teaching them? They don't want him to leave. I wonder, I wonder what it would be like to be taught, or what it will be like to be taught the scriptures by the one who inspired them. Jesus would have kept going if they hadn't asked him, but reality was he was waiting for an invitation. Uh, Jewish custom was to invite in a stranger. They used to say, invite a stranger who might prove to be a messenger from God. That's their custom. Verse 30, while he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. We really don't know why, but for some reason, Jesus is given the position of the host. That's the host's job, to give thanks and break the bread. And, and scholars believe that this happened at the end of the meal. So they had eaten, and then he does this. It says, and their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Now, <clears throat> we don't know, or we know of two specific times when Jesus had done this act of, of giving thanks and breaking the bread and giving it up. One is the feeding of the 5,000, and the other one is the Last Supper. We don't know what caused their eyes to be opened. Was it the act of the breaking the bread? Was it that when he broke the bread, they saw the nail marks in his hands? Was it divine intervention? Was it all of the above? Whatever it was, these two now recognize Jesus, the risen Christ. And as soon as they do, he's gone. They say to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he was with us on the road to while he opened to us the scriptures, what will it be like to hear Jesus talk and to teach about himself? To have the scriptures explained by the one who inspired them. It says, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So, so get this. They walk seven miles and then they walk back immediately in the dark. That's how excited they are. I have a question for you. Have you ever come to realize that Jesus had been right beside you, or God had been right beside you in a situation, and you didn't know? If you did, share it right now. Tell us about it. I know you had one. Yeah, share it. Hand up, turn around. Okay. <laughs> I was at, was it Brooke? I don't know how many years ago, but um, they made an altar call, and I went up to the altar, and I was, I was kneeling at the altar, and I was praying, and some, I thought somebody was behind me. I had a warm hand on my back, and I thought someone was behind me praying with me, so when I was done, I got up, and I said, Randy, you doing that? He goes, there was nobody there. So, but I had a hand, I had a warm hand on my back, and I know I did. So it's like, okay, all right, that was cool. <laughs> so I know I was touched. Yep. I always used to dream that I would be chased, and I was always running, and I was always two steps in front of the car. And I don't know if people know we live by the river, but I'm definitely afraid of water. Well, in this dream. I was running, so I was by the water's edge, no way to turn back, right, this person chasing, 
has come to the retreat, held my hand. I have no idea who it was, but I've never had a dream of being chased again. Um, so I think I'll get the car. <laughs> it was quite a few years ago, very early on in my career as a Christian. <laughs> I was I, I was at home and I don't know where the kids were. I only had three at that time. But I was sitting on the couch and um, I, I saw a black hole approaching me. And I knew I was going to fall in, and I was going to go in a depression. And uh, I, I knew that there was no way that I could stop it, because it, I suffered from depressions ever since I was a young teenager. And uh, so, so I recognized it, and I knew what it was, and I knew it was coming, and I knew that there was no way to tell how long it was going to last. It could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months. And I just sat there and I was afraid. And, um, mm. and uh, Jesus stepped out from beside me and stood between me and the boat. Amen. And it didn't come back. Amen. Wow. Anyone else? I know, I know for myself, um, statistics show that if, if, if a woman comes to faith, a mother comes to faith, there's like a 30% chance that the family will come to faith. And if a husband comes to faith, there's like a 90% chance. And uh, <clears throat> Brandy came to faith much earlier than I did. Uh, I had a lot of questions, but... I, I, I kept crying out to God, if you're real, God, let me know. If you're real, let me know. If, if I could just know, just once, just bend the rules and let me know that you're there. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. I will. Uh, and during all of that, even though it was an earnest prayer, I was living in both worlds. I was living in the church, living in the world. And I went out on a Saturday night and I got drunk. And I came to church Sunday morning and I was sitting where Ray was and Jim Ennis was preaching and he didn't even do an altar call. It was in the middle of his sermon. I got up out of my seat. I don't remember getting up. I was having a hard time staying conscious. That's how sick I felt. And I knelt at the altar here, the little altar. And this is what God said to me. Don't ever do this again. <laughs> and I stopped drinking. It was June before Travis was born. And I knew he was real. That's what I asked, right? And I did what Brenda did. I looked up. Oh, there's nobody here. <laughs> And I went and sat down very quietly, and I don't know what Jim preached that morning. I came home. I said to Brenda, I have to go to bed. Brenda was pregnant with Travis. And so lay down, and Brenda came in and lay down beside me, and I said, I'm not drinking anymore. And she said, Tell when. <laughs> and I said, Forever, and she giggled. There's lots of us in this room that can give testimony. No, go ahead. Like I left my body. I could see everything going on around me. 
So when these two gentlemen are asked what they're talking about, um, I sent the wrong title of the sermon to John. So the wrong title in the bulletin. Uh, not his fault, mine. Um, there are three words that stuck out in my head. We had hoped. They said, you know, there was this guy. <laughs> and he was doing so much. And we knew it was from God because he did things that nobody but God could do. And we had hoped. We are a people of hope. I have hopes. <coughs> you have hopes. <coughs> are there areas in your life right now, right here, right today, where you need the presence of Jesus to feel him close? A place where you need to feel he's alive. Because that's all they needed, right? They have this seven mile walk of dark despair going over the events of the weekend. And Jesus breaks bread and they realize he's alive. Because our hopes are alive in him. So do you have a place in your life where you need him to be alive? Where you need him to be close? Where you need to feel his presence? Revelation 3.20 says, I behold I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Let's stand. And I want to ask you a question. Will you? Will you? This is not about... The person beside you, it's not about your mom, it's not about your dad, it's not about your grandmother, it's not about your wife, it's not about your husband or your kids or your dog or your car or anything else. This is you. This is all on you. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you will open the door, I will come in. I can't open the door for you. Because if I could, I would. Your mom can't open the door for you. Your dad can't open the door for you. You cannot ride into heaven hanging on to mom and dad's coattail. The question is for you. Will you finally, finally today, open the door? And let him in? Because that's the question. That's the question we all have to answer. That's the question that I was asked <coughs> when I knelt at the altar. It came out as, don't ever do this again. But the reality was, will you open the door now? And so my question to you is, Will you open the door now? The altars are open. The altars are always open here. Maybe, maybe today's the day you need to open that door and let him in. Maybe today's the day that you really seriously want to feel his presence in your life. Maybe today's the day where you will dine with Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I had hoped. I had hoped a lot of things. 
until I met you. And then I realized what I need to hope in. Lord, I hope in eternity. I hope in a risen Savior. I hope in a love that's beyond anything I can understand. Lord, I thank you that I have felt your presence on so many different occasions. You have touched my life. You have changed my family. You have blessed us immeasurably. Lord, I pray for that one. That one today that will just open that door a crack and let you in. Come in and dine with them, Lord, and change us. Watch over our loved ones and our families, Lord. I lift up those we prayed for earlier, Lord, and I pray that in all things your presence would be glorified. And that we could run to our friends. They left with heavy hearts and despair, talking over the sad stuff. And they returned in the dark with light in their heart, with the message, He is alive. He is risen. We have seen the risen Savior. Lord, help us to understand that we don't need you to just come alongside us because we can have you living in us. And we walk with you every day. Help us to listen. In Jesus' name, amen.